So in this video I'm going to take a look at some progressive waves. So a progressive wave is a type of wave that transmits energy from one place to another. So the wave itself is actually moving as opposed to a stationary wave, which I'll address in a later video. So you've got energy moving in a given direction. So say on this diagram here, the wave might be going that way, or in this one at the bottom here, wave going along that way. Okay, so a transverse wave is one where the vibration of the particles of the medium it's traveling is perpendicular to the direction of travel. So if our direction of travel is going across the screen, you see the vibration of the particles is going up, uh, going up here and down here like this. So the direction of the vibration of them is going to be perpendicular to this direction here. Longitudinal, the vibration of the particles in the medium is in the direction. So what you get is the vibration in this direction here, and so that's in the same direction as the where it's traveling. So when you have a longitudinal wave, you get these regions of compression here, where all of the, it's all jumbled together, and these regions are what are called rarefaction, where it's stretched out here. And I'm going to use those for some of the definitions in the next slide. So there's a few key things you need to know. So first of all, amplitude, the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position. So this is your equilibrium position here, and your amplitude is this distance here, the maximum displacement from that equilibrium position here. Wavelength is the distance between either two peaks or troughs, so we've got crests here, also known as peaks, and the wavelength is the distance between them. You could equally do it as the distance between the troughs. That would be exactly the same. With a longitudinal wave, it would be the distance between these compressions here, or the distance between these rarefactions. I think you can see between compressions is slightly easier to do here, but no, you can use both. So, we've got the next two things. The period is the time between crests. So if a crest goes through, you start your stopwatch, and you stop it when the next crest comes through, that would give you the time period of the wave, and you can do the same thing with the compressions of a longitudinal wave. And the frequency would be the number of crests you would get going through in a second. So you time for a second, count how many crests have gone through, that tells you the frequency of the wave. And these things will be form part of the wave equation, which we'll come on to later. The next and final definition that we need to know is about phase difference. And this is a measure of the difference between two different waveforms, that, but the waveforms will be going at the same frequency or have the same wavelength, but they'll be out of phase with each other. So if you look at this diagram here, we've got one waveform, the blue here, and we've got one waveform, the black. So we can see here that the blue wave goes through pi over 2, I use radians because it's the SI unit of angle, and it hits a maximum. The black goes through a maximum at pi. So the difference between those is pi minus pi over 2, so the phase difference is equal to pi over 2 radians, or it would be uh, 90 degrees if you were doing in degrees, but I tend to stick to radians because that's the SI unit for angles. So when we move on to look at stationary waves, this phase difference is going to become very important to think about. Okay, so the next thing we need to look at is a special case, polarised waves. So only transverse waves can be polarised. So if we see on this diagram here, you've got lots of transverse waves. So this is actually all one signal, but it's made up of lots of different transverse waves. But you can see from the diagram, hopefully, that those they're rotated around. So this red one is just a rotation around from the green, uh, the blue one, sorry, and so is the green one. So they're in different planes. So they have different planes of polarization, if you like. So this is all one signal, but you can actually filter out these different polarizations of that wave. So one of the ways you can get a polarized wave is by 
reflecting it off a boundary. And the other way, which I'm going to move on to a look in more detail, is to pass it through a slit. So if we look here, at the top we've got this signal that's made up of this blue and this red transverse wave. And you see we're passing it through a slit that's in the same plane as the blue wave. So the red wave doesn't make it through, it's filtered out, and this, but this blue one does. So this wave has now become polarised because it's only in one plane. That's what a polarised wave is. So you pass it through a slit. And the other key thing is if we just have one plane in our original wave, and we pass it through a slit that's at 90 degrees to that plane, you're going to get nothing coming out the other side. So we can actually measure this effect of as we rotate the slit around. So if we start off with the angle being 0 degrees, so the slit is in the same plane as the, polar, as the polarized wave, we're going to have a high intensity if we measure it. And once it goes up and down to 90 degrees, the intensity is going to drop to 0 like this. And then it's going to go back up again, and it's going to drop to zero again, and it's going to keep doing like that. So you can think of this section here sort of like the reflection of the cosine wave, if you like. But it's going to keep going down until it'll reach a minimum or zero at 90 degrees, go back up again, go back down, go back up again, like that as you rotate the slit around. Okay, so those polarized waves. So let's have a look at some of the uses for these. Obviously it's important to think about where the science is used. So you've probably heard about polarised sunglasses. So they can be used to remove unwanted glare because they filter out some of the planes of light that are coming towards your eyes. So it's like partial polarisation. They only filter out some but not all of them. Um, another is in communication. So your radios, which used to be used on mobile phones, which often use microwaves these days, the signals between your, your phone and the mast or the satellite are polarised, so they're only in one plane. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you actually don't have any signal, just by rotating your phone around or spinning yourself around, you actually might be moving into the plane of polarisation, so you can likely uh, improve the signal of it. So... Um, that might be something useful to you if you ever find yourself out of range of signal. So there are actually some materials that can change the plane of polarisation of a wave. So some types of crystal are able to do this. So if we look at this diagram here, we've got a wave coming in in the vertical plane and it goes into the voodoo box and all sorts of crazy physics goes on and what you get out of it is a wave that's in a different plane so I'm showing this one in the horizontal plane but it might just be a small rotation but you do have the ability to rotate the planes of polarization sometimes so that can reduce the impact of using filters sometimes so you do have to be careful with that okay so the final thing the wave equation so first of all the wave equation itself is derived from this very basic equation you should already know. Speed equals distance over time. So specifically with a wave, if it's travelling in this direction here, so with a certain speed, the distance we're going to say is the distance between peaks, which would be the wavelength, and the time taken between peaks would be the period of the wave. Okay. So let's express this in simple form. So speed, V, is going to be the distance, which will be the wavelength, divided by the time period of the wave, which you often give it a big capital T. Now remember, T is the inverse of the frequency, because if the time period is the time for one wave, and the frequency is the number of waves per second, those are an inverse of each other. So remember this relationship here. So that means we can replace this in here. So V equals lambda times frequency. You may remember this from unit one, if you did unit one first, in the form of electromagnetic waves where C was equal to 
the wavelength times the frequency. So that's just a specific case where electromagnetic waves all travel at the speed of light. So you can use C instead of V. But the wave equation is V equals lambda times frequency. Really important to remember to keep them in the SI units. So V is in meters per second. Lambda is a wavelength, so it's in meters, and frequency is measured in hertz. And just an FYI, a hertz is the same, is a one over second in base units. Just if you ever get onto dimensional analysis and want to know actually what a hertz means, it's a one over second. That is the number of waves per second, if you like.